Well, I'm here to bring our first message of the day to you. And it's a little bit strange for me to be doing this, because normally, whenever I bring a message, I start the same way. I always say, open up your Bibles to dot, dot, dot. Don't open up your Bibles for this one, folks. I'm not talking about a biblical character today. I'm talking you about Charles Spurgeon, who I believe had a world impacting life. Now I'm here to talk to you about Spurgeon, not so much of him as a preacher, although I can't not talk about Spurgeon as a preacher because it was so much of how he made an impact on the world. But I want you to know that there's a lot more to Charles Spurgeon than just what he contributed to the world through his preaching that we can learn from and how we can be used of God to touch the world the same way. I don't know how qualified I am to speak about Spurgeon other than just to say this. I have loved that man and his ministry for a long time. I regard Charles Spurgeon as a mentor of mine. And I've read hundreds upon hundreds of his sermons and many of his books and other writings, even to the point, and I don't know if this is a confession or a declaration, but we named one of our children after Charles Spurgeon. Our oldest son, his name is Nathaniel Michael Spurgeon Guzik. <laughs> now, our second son is named Jonathan Nils Luther Guzik. God only knows what would happen if we kept having boys, so I don't know. It's, we stop there. Listen, I'm going to do two things here. First, I'm going to just sort of give you a broad overview of Spurgeon's life. And then I want to just pick out different things that I think that we can learn from his life relevant to our serving God in this present age. So first, let's start with the overview. Charles Spurgeon was converted on January 6th, 1850. It happened when he was 15 and a half years old. Now, he was raised in a Christian home, both in the home of his grandparents and his parents. You might say, well, why did he live with his grandparents if he was raised in a Christian home and his parents were godly people? I'll tell you one of the reasons he lived with his grandparents, and I'm just surmising here. His mother had 17 children. Nine of them died in infancy. And so you can just imagine that there would probably be good reason why Charles Spurgeon, for at least some of his life, would live with his grandparents. And he remembered those years. He grew up in village life in Victorian England. And so he was a man who knew what it was like to grow up in a small town, to be very close to the earth, even later when he spent almost all of his life and all of his ministry in the great city of London, which was the greatest city in the world at that time. Even so, he remembered what it was like to be a simple man growing up in a village. He was saved at a primitive Methodist church on a snowy, cold morning. It was as cold inside of the church as it was outside of the church. And when he walked into the church, he couldn't go to his normal church because it was too difficult to get there because of the snow. He stumbled into this uh, primitive Methodist church in a not a very big city in London, sort of a small village. He walked in there into that cold building and there were 13 people gathered together for worship on that particular Sunday morning. Now, the regular preacher didn't even show up. I don't know if he was sick. I don't know if he was unable to because of the snow, but he didn't show up. So at 11.05, five minutes after the service time was supposed to start, a nameless deacon of that primitive Methodist church took charge of the service. And so the deacon preached on the text Isaiah 45, verse 22. This is what the text says. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Now Spurgeon says that that man preached for only about 10 minutes and he was such a simple man. I was going to say ignorant, but I'll just say simple. He was such a simple man that all he could do was stick to the text. He, he wasn't smart enough to know that the most interesting things is what other people say about the text. No, no, no. He was simple enough to say, I'm just going to exhort people again and again to look unto Jesus. Let me read you an extended quote that Spurgeon quoted later on talking about his conversion. He said, I had been wandering about seeking rest and finding none till a plain unlettered preacher among the primitive Methodists stood up in the pulpit and gave out this passage as his text. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. 
He had not much to say, thank God, for that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. And there was nothing needed, by me at any rate, except his text. I remember how he said, it is Christ that speaks. I am in the garden in agony, pouring out my soul unto death. I am on the tree, drying, dying for sinners. Look unto me, look unto me. That's all you have to do. A child can look. One who's almost an idiot can look. However weak, however poor a man may be, he can look. And if he looks, the promise is that he shall live. Then stopping, Spurgeon says this, stopping the preacher pointed at me where I was sitting under the gallery and he said, that young man looks very miserable. <laughs> Spurgeon said, I expect I did, for that's how I felt. Then he said, there's no hope for you young man or any chance of getting rid of your sin but by looking to Jesus. And he shouted as I think only a primitive Methodist can, look, Look, young man, look now. And I did look. Now Spurgeon loved to tell that story. In his subsequent preaching, he told the story of his conversion more than 280 times in different sermons. Now he preached about 3,500 recorded sermons. So that was a lot in that proportion. So he was saved, marvelously saved. And within a year or so in 1851, he preached for the first time. It's a remarkable story about how Spurgeon first preached. A, a, a pastor had told him and a friend to go out to some village meeting where they were gonna teach what we would call essentially today a home Bible study. And as Spurgeon and his young friend were walking together to the home Bible study, they looked at one another and Spurgeon asked the guy, well, what are you gonna teach? And the guy said, what do you mean what am I gonna teach? I thought you were gonna teach. And Spurgeon said, no, you're gonna teach. And the guy said, no way, I'm not teaching, you're teaching. And Spurgeon said, okay, I'll do it. That was the first time that he ever taught the Bible. But let me tell you something. God's hand was upon that man's life. Because within a year, now please remember, he's only 16, 17 years old. Within a year, he was pastoring a small village church out there in rural England. And in that small village church, he started to gain a name for himself at this Water Beach Church. People came from miles around to hear this young, eloquent, passionately, maturely intelligent preacher who preached thoroughly biblical theology. And he looked even younger than he was. Three years later, in the year 1854, he was called to come to the New Park Street Church in London at age 19. Now Spurgeon had did such an outstanding job in this small village church that his name gathered attention. And people said, wow, so when this old established church in London that had once been a great church, the New Park Street Chapel, when it had fallen on some hard times and had reduced down to just a few hundred members, they invited Spurgeon to come and he took that charge, that church, I should say. Now the New Park Street Church invited that young man to come for a six month trial period. You know what Spurgeon said? Spurgeon said, let's make it three months because maybe the congregation doesn't want me and I don't want to be a hindrance to what God is doing there. But two weeks after he started that pastorate in London, a man gave the following prophecy regarding Spurgeon. This is what he said. He said, that young man will live to be the greatest preacher of this or any other age. He will bring more souls to Christ than any man who ever proclaimed the gospel except for the apostle Paul. His name will be known everywhere and his sermons will be translated into many of the languages of the world. Now, could you imagine prophesying that over a 19 year old young man? But that's what that man said about Spurgeon and it was proven true. By the year 1856, again, he's only 21 years old. He was married. And then also in 1856, there was a great tragedy of his life that helped shape and define the rest of his life. They called it the Surrey Gardens Music Hall Tragedy. It was on the evening of October 19th, nine, excuse me, 1856. Spurgeon was out there to start weekly services at the Royal Surrey Gardens Music Hall. The hall held up to 12,000 people. And Spurgeon was making such a huge impact on London that already everybody wanted to come out and hear the boy preacher. He was about 23 years old. So they crowded into this thing. There were 12,000 people crowded into that music hall, and there was another 10,000 outside in the gardens. 
The service was underway, and during a prayer that Spurgeon was offering at the beginning, several wicked men in the crowd started shouting, fire, the bleachers are giving way. And in the ensuing panic, seven people died and 28 people were hospitalized with serious injuries. Spurgeon was completely undone and he had to be literally carried from the pulpit and taken to a friend's house where he remained for several days in an unbelievably deep depression. Uh, later on, he remarked, he said, perhaps never a soul was so near to the burning furnace of insanity yet came away unharmed. It, it was absolutely a defining moment in Spurgeon's life. It, it, it really filled him with a sense of responsibility and dread and wondering, what is God doing with me? But years later, Spurgeon said of uh, this disaster, and it's interesting, I just read this in a sermon I was reading otherwise, of Spurgeon this week. He says this, quote, but how much of the success with which God has crowned our ministry has been due to the most afflicting providence that ever befell a Christian minister or a Christian church? Was it not, dear friends, to allude to that sad event which is still on the minds of some of us? This was decades later afterwards. And we will be till we die. When the cry was raised and death came into the midst of our solemn assembly, was it not due to that a very great extent that the preacher became known and that so he has ever had an opportunity of speaking to many more souls than otherwise would have listened to him concerning the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, let me tell you, Spurgeon saw the hand of God even in a terrible tragedy like that, and he got over it, and he continued to preach in the great public buildings of London, in Exeter Hall, in the Surrey Gardens Music Hall, in the Agricultural Hall, and in the Crystal Palace. By the time he was 23 years old, he had preached to crowds of 23,000 people. But then his ministry matured. By 1861, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was open and built in London. The new Park Street Chapel was too small. Spurgeon was 26 years old when this great building was erected, and he enjoyed another 30 years of ministry there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He preached to thousands every week. The building held somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 people. Make no mistake about it. Spurgeon was mostly famous as a preacher. He was a compelling, charismatic, dynamic preacher. As his friend John Carlyle remembered, he said that he was dramatic to the fingertips. And photographs from this period show him assuming dramatic stances when he preached. And visitors' accounts said that he would sometimes act out the parts of Bible characters as he preached. He would, uh, before age and before gout slowed him down, Spurgeon would even pace the platform and sometimes even run from side to side. One contemporary cartoon compared Spurgeon to the classic, shall I say, boring English preacher of his day. There's Spurgeon, all full of activity, while the fancy pants English preacher is there calmly behind his little pillowed pulpit. Another cartoon contrasted Spurgeon, calling him the young lion of the pulpit with the typical English preacher, whom it called the funny old woman of the pulpit. Uh, uh, still another cartoon showed the typical English preacher driving the slow coach and Spurgeon was riding the fast train. <laughs> By the way, I don't think you can see it on the graphic, but the fast train has a name on the wheel. It's called the Spurgeon. <laughs> now for an average sermon, Spurgeon took no more than one page of notes into the pulpit. Yet he spoke fast. It was at a rate of about 140 words a minute. And he would typically speak for about 40 minutes. And remember, he spoke to those great audiences, five, 6,000 people, week in, week out, at bigger crowds at special events, more than 23,000 on some occasion, without any kind of microphone, without any kind of sound system. That is a man who can speak. But he was a man of great passion in serving God, and he was especially a passionate preacher. 
Listen to what he said about passionate preaching. He said, why, some sermons hang like icicles upon the tips, of, upon the lips of the, preach, of the speaker. But the apostles preached as if they were all on fire. Their lips were like the mouth of, of a volcano when it vomits lava. Every word burnt its way into the heart and consciences of men. Never talk coldly of Christ who was on fire with love to you. Preach the gospel ardently. I love the idea of a preacher being like a volcano vomiting lava. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Spurgeon loved to preach. I'll never forget this one quote I read of his in a sermon. He says this, it may be also, but I do not know, and I cannot tell you, that we in future dispensations are to fill unto other worlds much the same office as angels fill in ours. Jesus hath made us kings and priests, and we are in training for our thrones. What if in this congregation I am learning to proclaim my master's glories to myriads of worlds? Possibly the preacher who is faithful here may be yet able to tell forth his Lord's glory to constellations at a time. What if one might stand upon a central star and preach Christ to worlds on worlds instead of preaching to him to these two galleries in this area? Why not? At any rate, I should ever gain a voice loud enough to be heard for millions of miles. I would speak none other than those glorious truths which the Lord has revealed in Christ Jesus. I love that idea of speech or thing. He's Spurgeon, I'm going to preach to the stars when I go to heaven. I'll preach, speech or preach, I should say, to galaxies. Now, he had a great worldwide ministry through his weekly published sermons and books. Now, again, uh, in this great worldwide ministry, he started it in about 1855. His sermon started weekly publication. Spurgeon would preach. He'd have a few people in the audience writing down every word he said. They would compare notes and bring him a final edition. And on Monday, he would edit it. On Monday afternoon or on Tuesday, it would go out to publication. By 1865, Spurgeon's sermons were sold about 25,000 copies a week. And they were translated into more than 20 languages. They were distributed widely, and in America, many newspapers published the weekly sermon from Spurgeon. They were collected and published in volumes, 63 volumes of 3,561 sermons. And God used those. You know, one woman was converted uh, because she read a single page of one of Spurgeon's sermons that was used to wrap a pound of butter that she had bought at the market. And Spurgeon's books sold into the millions of copies over the years. But he died relatively young. Spurgeon died in the year 1892 at 57 years of age. He died so young because of poor health and from the stress and the discouragement of controversies, now say this, because of the hard work that he had put in. Nevertheless, he served God gloriously in his days, and I want to spend the rest of my time together with you right now just going over some of the ways that I think we can learn from how God used Charles Spurgeon. First of all, I would say this. Spurgeon was an unexpected man to be used so greatly by God. Unexpected. Now, please understand, maybe some of you are unexpected people. Uh, maybe many of us are. Maybe that applies to almost everybody in this room. We're unexpected, but that's okay. God can use unexpected people. He was unexpected because of his background. He did not grow up in an aristocratic family. He didn't grow up in a great city. He grew up in a small village. It was also unexpected because of his youth. God used him at such a young age. You don't expect such a young man to be so biblically true, so passionate, and so eloquent in his presentation of the truth. You know, he, he, he was young, but God used him mightily. He was also unexpected because he lacked formal education. Please understand, Charles Spurgeon never went to college. Charles Spurgeon never went to Bible school. Charles Spurgeon never went to seminary. He missed being admitted to college because a servant girl inadvertently showed him into a different room than the principal who was supposed to interview him for college. He went to some building to be interviewed. 
The servant girl says, okay, wait here for the principal. The principal's over there in another room. And he said, the appointment never made. Instead of rescheduling the appointment, Spurgeon felt, even at a young age, that God spoke to him from Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5. This is the verse. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. And he felt that that was God's voice to him saying, Spurgeon, don't worry about college. You just get on with serving me. It was also unexpected because not only was he not formally trained, Spurgeon was never even formally ordained. He absolutely refused the title reverend. And the only title he would take unto himself was pastor. So are you unexpected? Don't worry about it. God can use unexpected people in a mighty way. Secondly, Spurgeon was a man of vision, faith, and activity. And I think those three things go together, right? You have vision to see what God can do. You have the faith to believe him to do it. And then you have the activity to start things off, at least in the direction to getting it done. Charles Spurgeon lived a remarkable life filled with many enterprises and ventures for God's kingdom. Listen, he was not only a preacher. If that was his only contribution to the world, that would have been enough. But he was much, much more than just a preacher. He had a pastor's college where he, teach, where he lectured every Friday afternoon. And that college trained more than 900 pastors during his lifetime and many more afterwards. He, he founded a monthly magazine to which he regularly edited and contributed. There were many sister or daughter churches that came out from the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He started two orphanages, one for boys and one for girls, and hundreds upon hundreds of orphans they served. He started a cheap book publication and distribution service that they called a coal portage society. He established a book fund to distribute books to pastors, which was managed by his wife, Mrs. Susanna Spurgeon. He had a large influential church, of course. He was a leader in book and sermon publication, and he led denominational associations. All of that, and he died in 1892 at only 57 years of age, yet he accomplished an incredible amount. Now you and I, we may uh, dislocate our shoulders patting ourselves on the back, and we think, oh, we're gonna live such a long time, listen. If we live a long time, and I pray to God that all, everybody in this room lives past 57, some of you have already succeeded. <laughs> Listen, do we not want those years to be fruitful years for Jesus Christ? Spurgeon was such a prolific writer that he is history's most widely read preacher ever, apart from the biblical ones. Today, there is more material available written by Charles Spurgeon than any other Christian author, living or dead. He sometimes had to answer 500 letters a week. And by accepting one of his many invitations to speak, Spurgeon often preached 10 times a week. He, he was a man who influenced other Christian leaders like Hudson Taylor and, and George Mueller and, and the British Prime Minister Gladstone and Lord Shaftesbury, the famous social reformer, and D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, and John Ruskin, the famous art critic and social reformer, and William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. His lives were intertwined with all these men, and he accomplished all of this in the brief time that he had on this earth. No, no, he was a man of vision, of faith, and of activity. Spurgeon was also a man who had a great ability to focus and to think through things. Now, this is something that we need to cultivate in our lives, do we not? I, I think all the more so in our modern age, uh, especially with the phenomena of instant information at our fingertips, that we're losing the ability to focus and deeply meditate upon things. Spurgeon had that ability. He knew how to break down a biblical text and examine it. Now friends, I've read many, many sermons by Charles Spurgeon, and in my view, I would roughly divide his sermons into two thirds and one third. About one third of his messages, he simply uses the text as a launching point. The text is just a point giving a suggestive thought by which he'll preach the gospel. But about two thirds of his sermons are what I would regard as brilliant expositions of a text. 
where he takes a Bible text and he examines it and meditates through it and turns it over and thinks through the implications in a way that you understand this man knew how to focus. This man knew how to analyze something and we should as well. Matter of fact, one of the greatest examples of this I found in my find in Spurgeon's life was at one time he was invited to speak at a church and, and traffic was so bad that his horse and carriage couldn't make it and, and he got there very late. Well, they wanted to start the meeting anyway. And so his grandfather, who was also a minister, was there. And his grandfather started preaching. And about 20 minutes into the preaching, Spurgeon walked in through the door. Well, this is what his grandfather told him. He said, grandson, I'm preaching on, I don't know what the text was, you know, John 3.16. Grandson, I'm preaching on John 3.16, and I've just finished my first point. Spurgeon walked up into the pulpit and continued that message without missing a beat from where his grandfather was. And Spurgeon said, well, of course, just look at the text. You can break it down into three or four points. And if he just finished his first point, I knew exactly where he had been. Friends, that's the ability to focus in and analyze something, and it's something that we need to cultivate in our lives. But make no mistake about it, and here's my fourth point. Spurgeon was a strong leader. Sometimes Spurgeon was called the Pope at Newington Butts. He certainly noted, or ruled, I should say, his congregation with a firm hand. Although it's probably wrong to call him a Pope, he would rather be just an enlightened despot in the leaders, in the words of some. Listen, his church structure was that there were deacons who ruled the church, but the practicality of it, everybody knew that this was Spurgeon's church, and he was a bold leader. His deacons adored him, sometimes seemingly to the point of idolatry. One, uh, presumably speaking for all of the deacons, once declared that if the pastor ever encountered a ditch, they would all fill that ditch with their bodies so that the pastor could cross over. <laughs> when Spurgeon heard that, he laughed and he said, that is grand talk. <laughs> Spurgeon once said in a sermon titled, uh, A Cheery Word in Troublous Times, listen to this quote. He says, every now and then we hear some simpleton or another talking against a one-man ministry when it has been a one-man ministry from the commencement of the world to the present day. And whenever you try to have any other form of ministry and doing it thoroughly and hardly and independently and bravely in the sight of God, you very soon run upon the quicksands. Oh no, make no mistake about it. Spurgeon was a bold, visionary leader and that's what God needs to raise us up as in this world. Next point I would say is that Spurgeon served God and served him well even through pain, physical pain, spiritual attack, and depressive episodes. Now make no mistake about it, he was an incredibly hardworking man. Before he was 20, Spurgeon had preached over 600 times. He often worked 18 hours a day. The famous explorer and missionary David Livingstone once asked Spurgeon, how do you manage to do two men's work in a single day? Spurgeon replied, you have forgotten that there are two of us. Now, I don't know exactly what he meant by that. Did he mean himself and God? Maybe that was so. Maybe he meant himself with the support of his wife. That could have been. Or maybe he meant that he was a big man and he was as big as two men. I really don't know. But during his lifetime, Spurgeon is estimated to have preached to 10 million people. Yet he was often ill, often depressed, often under great spiritual heaviness and a sense of responsibility. This is what he said once in a sermon. He said, I confess it very quietly but I have often wished that I had a little congregation, that I might watch over every soul in it. But now I am doomed to everlasting dissatisfaction with my work. For what am I among so many? I can only feel that I have not even begun to do the hundredth part of what needs to be done in such a church as this. He lived the last 20 years of his life in almost constant pain. He suffered from rheumatoid gout and from kidney problems and from many other ailments. His wife Susanna also suffered and she, that was also a burden for Spurgeon. 
She became basically, not completely, but basically an invalid at the age 33, and she could seldom attend her husband's services after that. Yet, he declined to slow down. During his first significant illness, and that was in October 1858, Spurgeon wrote to his congregation and readers this. He said, do not attribute this illness to my having labored too hard for my master. For his dear sake, I would that I may yet be able to labor more. And later in a sermon he stated, I look with pity upon people who say, do not preach so often, you will kill yourself. Oh my God, what would have Paul said to such a thing as that? So again, he was a remarkable man. I look at Spurgeon's life and I see a man who knew number one, how to play, so to speak, through the pain. He wasn't the kind of guy who would, you know, get a hangnail and say, oh, I can't preach today. No, he would play through the pain. Nevertheless, he knew what his limits were and he knew when to take a break. Spurgeon would take, oh, weeks or months off of his duties and go to the south of France where he would vacation and recuperate. He was wise enough to know, listen, there's times when I just simply need a break. And he was wise enough to know there's times I got to just run through it and, and play in the midst of the pain. Oh, God, give us that wisdom. And by the way, can I say this? Pray for your pastor that he would have that kind of wisdom, right? That he would have the wisdom to know this is when I just got to put my head down and gut it out. And when he would know, nope, I got to take a break because that's going to be best for the Lord's work. Next point. Spurgeon was loved and he was adored, but he was also hated and mocked and attacked. Now, becoming pastor of the historic New Park Street Baptist Church, he, he found the press was virtually at war with him. The Ipswich Express said that his sermons were full of bad taste, vulgar and theatrical. And so what did Spurgeon say in response? He said, I am perhaps vulgar, but it's not intentional, except that I must and will make the people listen. By the way, I love that statement. Spurgeon said, I must and I will make the people listen. My firm conviction is that we've had quite enough polite preachers and many require a change. God has owned me among the most degraded and offcast let others serve their class. These are mine, and to them I must keep. Later on, Spurgeon would say about all those people who criticized him and attacked him, he would say this, be ready for a bad name, be willing to be called a bigot, be prepared for the loss of friendships, be prepared for anything, so long as you can stand fast by him who bought you with his precious blood. In the same sermon, he said this, a Christian should be willing to be tried. He should be pleased to let his religion be put to the test. There, says he, hammer away if you like. Do you want to be carried to heaven upon a feather bed? <laughs> Listen, sometimes the answer among us is yes. <laughs> but these bold words from a servant of God like Charles Spurgeon, they're a rebuke to us, are they not? He said in another message, I have sometimes thought that when I've seen a good joke cracked over my poor head, that there's so much misery in the world that if I might be the cause of making a little more mirth, I should be glad. And even if it was told against me, if I made somebody feel a little merrier, it was not a matter for great sorrow. You know, for some of us, the worst thing in the world is to think that people are laughing at us. What did Spurgeon say? He said, well, look, there's enough sadness in the world. If I can bring a few laughs by people mocking me, well, then that's not an entirely bad thing. Now, he was also embroiled in great controversies at the end of his life. He even resigned from the Baptist Union that he had been a part of for so long. But these controversies, these battles, even though he was so greatly loved by many people, he knew how to continue on even though he was attacked and vilified by many others. And this kind of brings me to another point, my next point about Spurgeon. Spurgeon held tenaciously to his beliefs without becoming a jerk. Now, do you know what I mean by that, right? Listen, there's some people who hold tenaciously to their beliefs. And brother, sister, you can keep holding on to them. Because you hold on to them in such an unattractive, jerkish way that we want nothing to do with you. Spurgeon knew how to hold on tenaciously to his beliefs, but without corrupting his heart, 
his soul before God or his fellow man. Now make no mistake about it, Charles Spurgeon understood himself to be a five-point Calvinist, and he stood up for those beliefs when not many other people did. He sometimes said that Calvinism is the gospel, and the gospel is Calvinism. Yet he was also not Calvinistic enough for some of his critics. For example, one newspaper in his day reported, Mr. Spurgeon is a Calvinist in name only. And he was rejected by many of the high Calvinistic churches. The pastor of the Surrey Chapel, for example, in London, spent time every Sunday criticizing Spurgeon's previous sermon because it was not Calvinistic enough. At the same time, Spurgeon was certainly not admitted to Arminian circles because he was far too Calvinistic for them. You see, overall, it would seem that Spurgeon just didn't care. He was passionate about biblical theology, but he didn't feel compelled to organize it according to a systematic theology. He once said that angels might write and understand a systematic theology, but men should just stick to the Bible. Therefore, even though he strongly held what he would regard as Calvinistic beliefs, he held them in a way that put the scriptures first. And he loved and appreciated those in the body of Christ who disagreed with him as long as they themselves took the Bible seriously. For example, listen to this quote from Spurgeon. I myself am persuaded that the Calvinist alone is right upon some points and the Arminian alone is right upon others. There's a great deal of truth in the positive side of both systems and a great deal of error in the negative side of both systems. If I were asked, why is a man damned? I should give the Arminian answer. He destroys himself. I should not dare to lay man's ruin at the door of divine sovereignty. On the other hand, if I were asked, why is a man saved? I could only give the Calvinistic answer. He's saved through the sovereign grace of God and not at all of himself. Or, or another one, he says this. When a Calvinist says that all things happen according to the predestination of God, he speaks the truth, and I'm willing to be called a Calvinist. But when an Arminian says that, when a man sins, the sin is, is his own, and that if he continues in sin and perishes, his eternal damnation will die, lie entirely at his own door, I believe that he also speaks the truth, though I am not willing to be called an Arminian. The fact is, there is some truth in both of these systems of theology. And finally, I think this last quote gives a good sense of, Cal of Spurgeon's heart. He says, we had better far be inconsistent with ourselves than with the inspired word. I have been called an Arminian Calvinist or a Calvinistic Arminian, and I'm quite content so long as I can keep close to my Bible. You see, that is a man with a big heart. There's a prayer attributed to Spurgeon though I've never found it confirmed, but it's one of those things too good to, you know, deny, even though I've never found it proven, that one time Spurgeon prayed before an audience. He prayed a very Calvinistic prayer. He said, Lord, hasten to bring in all your elect. And then he said, and then elect some more. <laughs> that is a man with a big heart. Now Spurgeon also had the wisdom and the love to deal with personal conflicts and controversies. He was a man of great pastoral wisdom. He knew how to tell people, listen, just, just, just ignore things that people are saying about you. I would recommend highly to those of you who have an interest in serving God, two books by Charles Spurgeon. One, an all-round ministry, and secondly, lectures to my students. Those are two wonderful books for anybody who's interested in serving God. But, but he has a lot of wisdom in those places. He says this, it would be better to be deceived a hundred times than to live a life of suspicion. And then later on he says, brethren, shun this vice by renouncing the love of self. Judge it to be a small matter when men think or say of you and care only for their treatment of your Lord. If you are naturally sensitive, do not indulge the weakness nor allow others to play upon it. You see, Spurgeon understood something. He understood something that we should understand as leaders and as workers in God's kingdom. He understood that your critics can be of great help to you. There, there was a period in Spurgeon's ministry where he received a letter every week from an anonymous writer. And the letter 
pointed out every place where he felt in Spurgeon's sermon he had made an error. Oh, you mispronounced this word. Oh, you used this illustration for the third time in four weeks. Oh, I think your theology was off on this one. Pastors, could you imagine getting a letter like that? Well, some of you can imagine it. You get something very much like that. Every week, Spurgeon got that letter from the same guy. And you know what he said about it? He said, my only regret is that the guy never signed his name because I never knew who to thank. He said, I didn't agree with everything the guy said. I mean, some points, I think the guy was wrong. But you know what? He said, that man made me a better preacher. Spurgeon knew how to listen to his critics. And then I would say on this, Spurgeon was a man of great vision and great faith. You know, I think about what he accomplished in London, and I think of what a great heart he had with London. I don't know how to say it other than just to read to you some extended uh, section from some sermons that Spurgeon preached in sections where he spoke about London. So let me read this to you, and you'll get an idea of his great vision, both stretching back to the past and into the future. Listen. Oh, this great city. It grows at an awful rate, but God has much people in it. Depend on it. I believe in London. God means to bless it largely. You will say, why? Well, I look back on its past history and I have hope. The martyr's blood lies here. When all the country was yielding its martyrs, London furnished its full share. On this very spot where we now are, three were burnt for truth's sake. Members of our ancient persecuted church were often in London burnt for the truth's sake and for Christ's sake, and from the ground their blood is calling still. All over this London of ours, the preaching of the gospel was precious in the old times. You hear the name of Gospel Oak as you travel in the north of London, and the tree was there so called because the gospel was preached there, and crowds gathered beneath its shade to listen to the joyful sound all about the city, secret bands met to worship God after the gospel way. Now the Lord will never let the blood of the martyrs die out. It will ever be the seed for the church. See again how London kindled with holy fire in the days of Whitfield and Wesley. Go but a mile from this place and notice Kennington Park, once Kennington Common. What thousands used to gather there to hear the gospel preached. The men of South London loved the gospel, multitudes of them, and they still do. I feel sure that God will bless London yet because at this very moment, if the gospel is still preached so that people can understand it, they will throng to hear it. Alas, poor men cannot understand half the preachers. They preach Latin fit for drawing rooms. If they would go to Billingsgate and learn English, they might get on. <laughs> you say, well, that would be very rough English. Well, the roughest of English might be better than the Latinized jargon of most of our pulpits. When men preach the gospel plainly and simply, they will never lack a congregation in this great city. I am certain of it, and I am sure that the Lord has much people in this city because there's a hungering and thirsting after the gospel if they could but get at it. My friends, aren't you inspired by vision like that? Don't you look back at our own communities, and sometimes it's easy to get extremely discouraged, is it not? You say it seems well nigh hopeless. It is not hopeless. If God could touch London in Victorian England, he can touch our communities. But it'll take men of faith. It'll take women of vision. It'll take people of great activity and passion. Now, God has raised them up before. Charles Spurgeon is just one of many examples. But I think that more than anything, Spurgeon shows us the greatness of a life and the impact of a life spent for Jesus Christ. And one of the most touching stories I've ever read of Spurgeon's life, very old in his life, you know, in the last few years, he was walking through London and he was not a fit man. He was leaning heavily upon his cane and making his way down the street. And then he was faced with an intersection where he had to cross the intersection in order to get at the bank where he had to do some business. And as the traffic rushed by, you know, of course, it would be carriages and horses and, and people walking fastly and businessmen and bicycles and all the rest. Spurgeon looked across the street and he said what more than one old person has said at that stage in their life. They said, I don't think I can make it. 
No, there wasn't a button to push for a crosswalk, right? You had to just make your way across the street the best you could. And Spurgeon looked at the traffic and goes, I, I can't do this. Just then, he felt a hand on his arm. And it was a blind man saying, Sir, would you help me across the street? <laughs> Spurgeon did it. He did it for the sake of someone else, what he was not willing or felt able to do for himself. Well, friends, listen, Jesus isn't blind. Jesus isn't a beggar. But will we not let Jesus inspire us to do for him, for his sake, what we might not do for ourselves? You, you say, I, I don't think I can do it. I, I don't want to give my life. I don't want to spend my life that much. Do you not feel the hand of Jesus on your shoulder saying, well, would you please do it for my sake? Okay, fine. You won't do it for your own sake. I understand. Would you do it for my sake, and would you do it for the sake of those for whom he died? A life spent for Jesus Christ. That's a glorious heritage to us through these great men and women of God, Charles Spurgeon being among them. Father, stir us up. Give us vision. Give us faith. Give us renewed vigor in our activity that we might do for the sake of Jesus what we would not do merely for our own sake. We don't think of this in a moment, Lord, in the idea of earning your favor or your salvation. No, Lord, it's the pure gift of gratitude back to you for what you've already given to us. Fill us with it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.